Hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you today. My name is Paul Stoddart. I'm the president of new payment platforms at MasterCard. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you for the next 15, 20 minutes about the future of payments. It's a big topic, but I'm going to focus on a small number of ideas. Uh, hopefully you'll be familiar with them all. So let me start really, of course, by talking about real-time payments, because the real-time payment phenomenon has uh, really taken uh, the world by storm, particularly over the last five years. And at the base of real-time payments is often a need, an understanding, a desire by government, central banks, and, and the commercial and retail banks in the market uh, of the need to modernize the payments infrastructure for the country. And quite often, this driver has a political dimension, as well as you know, clearly a technology uh, and a commercial dimension. Ultimately, you know, quite often, the central bank is sitting at the heart of this desire to modernize their infrastructure. We now see that you know, over 70 countries have already implemented or are in the middle of implementing uh, a, a real-time payment solution. And that also reflects on the significance and the impact that these new uh, payment solutions have on the economy and the speed with which uh, global adoption of real-time payments is happening. That number of markets actually accounts for over 85% of the world's GDP. And so we're, we're looking very clearly at the prospect of uh, the global transition to real-time payments for the vast majority um, of GDP markets within a small number of years. The pandemic itself, uh, for which we have all suffered in one way, shape or form, has actually accelerated uh, the usage of real-time payments beyond all expectations. <laughs> Latest data shows that global transaction volume is up over 40%. Uh, real-time payments provide a smarter and faster alternative to checks and traditional ACH and backed payments. But the elusive uh, quest for the replacement of cash um, has been the challenge in the last few years and real-time payments offers a number of characteristics that make that goal uh, potential to be realized. Beyond the speed uh, associated with real-time payments, uh, as it says in the name, uh, is the ability to transmit an enormous amount of data. And it is often through the usage of the data that we can develop new and innovative uh, products and services for our various customers. For banks in particular, who play a significant role at the heart of the delivery of payment solutions into the market, it gives them a greater insight into customer behavior. It enables them to improve efficiency and transparency and manage risk, all benefits of any good payment system. Of course, you know, MasterCard, we're very proud to be part of the implementation of a number of these solutions around the world. And we're extremely proud uh, and humbled by the decision from Payments Canada to select us to participate in what will uh, certainly be a transformative initiative within the market. One of the reasons we think uh, we are often chosen to support a country's objectives um, is because of our proven experience in delivering and managing running uh, real-time payment systems around the world. As I mentioned, you know, we're very proud with the decision uh, from Payments Canada, um, but our technology actually underpins real-time payment systems across all four corners of the globe or five continents. So from the UK, the humble beginnings of faster payments and Vocalink in the UK, uh, we now provide technology to the clearinghouse in the US, to uh, Fast in Singapore, uh, to PromptPay in Thailand, and uh, more recently, our systems have gone live in Saudi Arabia, Philippines, Peru, and there's a number of other markets in the pipeline. And so in total, we power you know, 14 of those top 50 GDP markets with our real-time payment solutions. And every implementation, you'll perhaps be interested to know, has a lot of common features um, and experiences uh, within the market for the implementation itself. Of course, each market has its own 
uniqueness and its own local requirements. But on the whole, I think you'll be pleased to know that it's great to see that the world is moving closer to adopting ISO 20022, for example, as its message format, which uh, will absolutely make the lives easier, more efficient of all the participants in the ecosystem. So I talked about the top, uh, the 14 markets. So of course, you know, let me talk a little more about some of those unique regional or local requirements. Uh, P27, which is an initiative in the Nordics where the Nordic banks across four markets have come together to procure uh, the world's first real-time cross-border and multi-currency payment system um, is a real bold step from a region that typically has a heritage of being very creative and, and setting the bar for others in the adoption of technology and the leverage of technology. Particularly in some of the markets in that region, cash uh, forms a less than 10% of all payments in the economy. And so they really are on a digital journey that has been further accelerated by the pandemic. <clears throat> when we think about implementing real-time payment systems around the world, we think about it in three layers. The infrastructure layer, which is the core base clearing and settlement layer that works closely with the central bank uh, and enables all the participant banks in the market to connect. The next layer is the application layer. And these allow us to support use cases and to provide product capability to banks and other participants in the market in order to drive new revenue use cases and indeed provide new customer experiences uh, ultimately driving transactions to the infrastructure layer. And MasterCard's multi-rail strategy enables us to deliver applications into market that can drive transactions to both our card network infrastructure and our account-to-account -account real time infrastructures. And we're also working on a number of solutions that will allow us to leverage blockchain. The last layer of the, system, of the stack as we describe it, the services layer, it gives us another opportunity to build value-added capabilities, leveraging the data that flows in the transaction. And together, the infrastructure applications and services layer provide our frame of reference for executing on the multi-rail strategy. So I'm going to talk to you now about three trends that we see emerging um, over the course of, I would say, the next five years as a minimum, but will probably have longer-term implications uh, because of their pervasiveness. The first trend I want to share and talk to you about is open banking. So in the UK, and I use the UK as a, an example market, as the open banking ecosystem has now been running for a couple of years. But more than three years ago, the, the UK launched its open banking framework. Um, and PSD2 obviously came into effect in Europe. And open banking has played a significant role in stimulating innovation in financial services. The phenomenon continues to grow around the world. Some of the numbers I share with you on the slide show from, again, very humble beginnings of single digit tens of thousands of transactions to now millions or billions of API calls um, and the adoption really across a region of quite a broad number of, of services and capabilities with a wide ranging set of, of participants. Really open banking provides a new environment, a new ecosystem through which uh, consumers and businesses can exert considerable amount of control over the data that banks and indeed potentially other parties hold on them. Um, it really is uh, changing the nature of the relationship that a bank uh, has with its consumers and business customers. But more importantly, it's enabling third parties fintechs, businesses, merchants, um, to change the nature of their relationship with their customers and indeed access significant more data on, on their behavior, on trends, um, on uh, shopping habits in particular, or spending habits, I should say, um, with, of course, the right permission frameworks. And that's absolutely critical. So we see um, our own position as MasterCard in the, in the open banking space through three different lenses. The first lens is the connect lens. Now, this is how we enable third parties to connect using the open banking APIs to, to banks on behalf of uh, consumers and businesses. Um, the protect layer, of course, means that 
you know, for, for the banks to enable access to these participants in the market, they need to know that uh, they're safe to do so uh, and that they're not inviting bad actors into the ecosystem. And so the protect set of services helps banks protect the network that them themselves against um, underperformance, poor performance, bad actors, fraud, risk, etc., from within the third party community who want to leverage the, the open banking API channels. And the resolve solution enables participants within the ecosystem to um, engage in a forum to resolve challenges, difficulties when they arise um, as a result to a specific transaction, very similar to what you might understand to be a chargeback or dispute resolution capability within a card network. And, and hence, that's a good example of why MasterCard feels it's well positioned. The growth of open banking is not just localized within the EU and the UK, of course. We've seen it grow significantly across the globe. Uh, and as you can see from uh, the way we've uh, shaded the globe here, you know, we're seeing markets develop typically in two ways, either regulatory driven in, in, in this example, such as the EU, where regulators for the region have set uh, a, a requirements for participants. <clears throat> And then we see other markets where typically have been left more to market forces to drive the development. And in some cases, markets will um, often utilize uh, both over a period of time. So open banking, absolutely front and center trend that we are participating in and feel is important for our customers to participate in. So if I talk about digital currencies next, uh, another trend that I think is um, very exciting and taking a number of twists and turns. Um, at the heart of it, you know, ultimately payments really does come down to choice and choice is more than just you know, debit and credit and the funds that you've had in your bank account. So digital currencies, in particular the exploration by central banks uh, around digital currencies has a real um, fundamental impact on the way we engage within payment systems, the way we make an uh, purchases and we, way we receive money. Typically today, you know, digital currencies have really been an asset class that parties have held as an investment. But the next phase of growth uh, we see within the digital currency environment is very much linked to how those digital currencies become part of the transaction and indeed enable transactions for our customers, whether that's consumers or businesses, both to make transactions and payments for things that they're used to doing all the time, but also for new things. Um, and obviously digital currencies have particular application in the digital environment, the digital economy, um, where digital goods and services, you know, often with immediate fulfillment, require sources of value and funds that, that are also better suited to, to those types of transactions. So we see digital currencies forming you know, also a key factor in how financial services and in particular payments evolve um, over the next few years. The role of central banks, the role of retail and commercial banks in the ecosystem is all being examined very closely, driven by the push within the digital currency community um, for greater and wider adoption um, of these uh, new ways, new sources of value or assets. The last trend that I wanna to touch on is really around digital identity. So as the digital economy expands and evolves, um, as we continue to uh, invest in uh, everything going digital, which has no doubt been accelerated by the pandemic itself, as I mentioned before, um, we see digital identity as a critical problem to solve. Now, it is very clear that you know, in a digital environment, identity becomes a critical factor in establishing the trust in the relationship. Uh, and trust in payments and financial services is critical to success. Uh, establishing trust means ensuring that I understand who I'm doing business with. And in doing so, I need to be able to rely on a service, you know, an example of an identity service here where you know, a relying party needs to check something, um, I think is the first stage of how we will see digital identity rolling out. Uh, and then as we see consumers and businesses want to control their identity, shape it and position it differently depending on the transaction that they are um, undertaking, 
uh, then we see the identity, the needs of digital identity to evolve over time to accommodate the needs of, of multiple different transaction types. Not all of those will have um, a payment related to it, but that trust, the, re the requirement for trust to be created, uh, and then the ongoing establishment and utilization of identity that can be trusted within a digital environment um, without uh, uh, becoming dependent on a particular channel is undoubtedly a need um, for the future. And another area that MasterCard has identified as a key area investment for us um, over the next uh, five years. And so they were the three trends I wanted to share with you. I couldn't uh, have this conversation with you without talking about real-time payments up front as well. Um, and um, I hope you found it interesting and I'm very happy to take questions um, either as part of the programme or separately. So don't hesitate to get in touch and thank you.